Eliza Pinckney, the woman who brought indigo to the United States. Now, Eliza Pinckney was actually born, born in Antigua in the Caribbean. But her father was an extremely important man who owned a bunch of property. And since there were some wars breaking out, he was worried about being on an island in the Caribbean where France or Spain could just show up and attack at any time. So he decides to move the family to South Carolina. Now, about this time, he actually sends Eliza Pinckney, uh, whose name at the time was Eliza Lucas, to Europe to get an education. Now, not many women were afforded this type of ed education. It was mostly given to men, but Eliza did get this education, where notably she talks about her interest in botany. Uh, this comes notable because she goes back and joins her family in S South Carolina for about a year when her father is elected lieutenant governor of Antigua, or not elected, chosen by His Majesty the King, and he has to go back and govern. But they have all these plantations, which had many slaves, I do want to note that, in South Carolina. And she's in charge of three plantations uh, and all the labor and all the work that's going on there because just after her father leaves, her mother passes away. So 16-year-old Eliza, 17-year-old Eliza Lucas is left in charge of these three plantations. And she runs them very successfully and becomes notable as a businesswoman. In fact, 200 years, 250 years later, just about 20 years ago, 30 years ago, she's chosen uh, as the first woman to be uh, selected to, I believe it's South Carolina's Business Person Hall of Fame. Either way, Pinckney starts running these business. Again, her name is still Lucas at this point, as a teenager, starts running these businesses, and she gets a few seeds of indigo, and people were not able to grow indigo very well at the time, but she spends several years learning how to grow indigo in South Carolina's climate. Now, indigo seems not like it's important, right? It is, because indigo helps you make blue dye, and for hundreds, if not thousands of years, royalty wore blue, because blue doesn't actually appear that often in nature. And if you think about it, you probably think of blueberries right off the bat and a few flowers. But other than that, there's not a whole lot of blue in nature. And, and even, I understand, people used to think the sky was a shade of gray, but that's neither here nor there. Eliza Pinckney is able to grow indigo. And with the budding cotton, not cotton, I'm sorry, not cotton, not yet for cotton, but cotton, uh, not cotton, fabric, cloth. The word was cloth. I can get it out. Uh, in the budding cloth industry in the Americas, getting blue dye was extremely lucrative to the point where Eliza Pinckney learns how to grow indigo in the uh, early 1740s. And she, the few years later, does it so well that she grows seeds and sends them to all of her neighboring plantations and says, hey, can you guys grow indigo? And they all follow her instructions. Again, as a teenager, follow her instructions on how to grow indigo. And in less than 10 years, indigo grows from not being able to grow to the second most important export in South Carolina. And 30 years later, by the time the Revolutionary War breaks out, it is rice and then indigo is one third of the income of South Carolina, all because of this woman's hard work and an intuition and and planting expertise uh and it is one of those cr cash crops that we don't often think of we don't often think of rice either but those are two cash crops that are extremely important to the development of the united states again unfortunately on the back of thousands hundreds of thousands of slaves but neither here nor there that still is uh how the country developed and her indigo uh gives her a lot of credit for developing it now she ends up marrying a man named Charles Pinckney. Now, that name might sound familiar to you learning about the American Revolution, but this is the father of the person you're thinking of. She marries Charles Pinckney, uh, who is about 23 years older than she is, but he was widowed, and uh, or his spouse had died, and he married a younger woman. They seem to have had a happy marriage. They actually traveled to London for a while because uh, Charles Pinckney acts as South Carolina's agent. Now, when they return... Unfortunately, Charles passes away, but Eliza at this point had had two children. I do want to also note before I move on to them that Eliza kept diaries throughout her life. And we know a lot about colonial South Carolina firsthand accounts through her discussions, not only about her development of uh, indigo, but about life in general at the time. Now, her and Charles had two children, Charles Coatsworth Pinckney and Thomas Pinckney. And these would be extremely important. Uh, Charles would sign the United States Constitution, and Pinckney would travel to Europe. He actually helped uh, with the Jay Treaty 
in England before going to Spain and signing the Pinckney Treaty, which did a lot of the same things as the Jay Treaty. After that, they come home, and in the elections of 1796, Charles, uh, oh, I don't want to get them confused. Okay, in the, between Charles and Thomas, in the election of 1796, one was John Adams's vice presidential running mate, though we know that ended up being Thomas Jefferson, though they ran against each other. In 1800, one of the brothers was vice presidential candidate for uh, John Adams. And in 1804 and 1808, I believe it was Thomas Pinckney was the Federalist candidate for President of the United States. So in, in after George Washington left, in the first four elections after George Washington, one of her sons was either the Vice Presidential or Presidential candidate for the Federalist Party for the United States of America. Eliza Pinckney is literally a founding mother in every fashion you look at it. Uh, she's an extraordinarily important person in the history of the United States. And I hope you now keep her in mind when you think about American history.